Hey, good morning. Welcome back. Doug Padger Radio on AM 950. Sunday, September 18th. 106 in the afternoon. An hour or two of our little afternoon delight. A conversation about religion, good things going on in the world, things happening in people's lives. And I'm uh, thrilled to be joined by my guest, Paul Franklin. Paul is a part of a project called the Common English Bible. They've decided we need a new Bible. Decided that back in 2007 and put one together, and it's sitting in front of me right now. Paul, thanks for being on the show. Thank you for inviting me, and I look forward to this conversation. All right. So I had Eugene Peterson on the show a little while back, another guy who wrote the Bible, and I I (laughs) wanted to ask him, I'm like, so how does a guy get the nerve to, like, say, hey, you know what? I think we need a new kind of Bible around this world, and I'm going to make one. Now, you didn't uh, sit down and do a personal translation yourself. Instead, you used another process, a collaborative process involving lots of people. But how did you decide, and and what, what makes you think, hey, you know what we need is a new Bible? You know, Bible translation is and always has been an act of protest. I know earlier in your uh-huh. show you were talking about activism. Yeah, right. And the very act of uh, translating the Bible uh, brings about change. Mm-hmm. And in fact, uh, the early change agents in the Protestant Church all focused their work around Bible translation. You had Erasmus, you had Luther, Wycliffe, Tyndale, John Calvin, uh, a French doctor by the name of Lefebvre. Uh, most of that work took place in the 16th century, yeah. went over into the 17th century. and that so, so you put act, yourself in pretty good company. Yeah, but that's not me. <laughs> yeah. um, I think the reason that It is they, now, Paul. We're well, not going to add you to that. Kind of, uh, that they took that kind of an approach is that um, Protestants were called to read the Bible for themselves. I see. When the Bible is not in a language that you can understand very well, mm-hmm. if it's pitched at too high of a reading level, mm-hmm. or if it's pitched in Latin, you're yeah. not going to be able to figure out the language for yourself. Mm-hmm. You're going to have to depend on somebody else. And they were getting pretty frustrated with the fact that even after the printing press emerged, um, Bibles were owned by churches, but not by uh, common people. And so they went after this particular problem. They had a whole uh, set of agenda. And in fact, many people today could argue that the Reformation is over. We're not still living in that time of the Protestant Reformation. Right. Yeah. What's happened as a consequence, too, is that many, um, it's one of the liabilities of kind of individualism and also uh, reading the Bible for yourself is people start to use the Bible as a weapon to score theological points against each other. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, and a lot of people argue about one translation over the other. Uh, very, very fervently, don't they? I mean, like, like I bet when you got into the business of saying, we want to provide an alternative translation of the Bible, and for people who don't know, what you're saying is you're going to have people look again at some of the earliest manuscripts in their original language and find a way to translate those into English. So that's what you're doing by a translation. You're not changing the stories or deciding which books are included in the Bible. You're that's right. Tra- you're, you're translating the language inside of the canonical set of books in the Bible and the Apocrypha. Right. Um, but people get uh, p- people got nervous about that, I would imagine. I mean, I bet there were people who said to you, like, look, we don't need a new version. We just need people to read the old version and start doing it. I mean, that, that kind of argument. Did you, did you get a lot of that pushback when you said, let's put together a new translation of the Bible? Sure. You've got uh, people have their favorites, their preferred translations. Uh-huh. And another point about Protestantism is that no denomination has ever told the members of that denomination or religious group, this is the Bible you're supposed to read, because to do that would to defy the Protestant principle. You, and even Catholics don't do that as much as they used to. Huh. Um, but I mean, I know people who do that all the time. I know people who push, like, particular, maybe the CEV version or something. They're like, look, you read anything? And my King James-only friends, they do that stuff all the time. That's right. They're always uh, saying that. I've even gotten my one death threat from the King James-only crowd. Oh, you did? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, there's a fringe out there that actually thinks that the only inspired text of the Bible yeah. is the one that was delivered by the King James right. uh, translators. And it's kind of sad, because if they actually read very deeply into that, they'd realize how much intrigue went into that project. Yeah. But the... Uh, well, so, so, so you suggest that, look, we're, because of a dynamic times, change in language, change in culture, mm-hmm. that Bible translations are always of a particular age, and we need to do the constant work of 
updating for the language. And some of the press material you sent, I thought this was interesting. You said a translation is necessary because to clearly communicate the Bible in an atmosphere where there's 9,000 new words and meaning revisions added yearly to the English lexicon. So you all, like, took it seriously about the way people speak and tried to make updates in the, in the, the, the text of the translations to fit the way that people speak in current English That's right. usage? That's right. And in the days do, of Like you got uh, dude in there and all that stuff? You, is it, you got little, like the Jesus LOL and that kind of thing? Yeah, we didn't go that far. <laughs> uh, you know, there's a million words in the English language now. Yeah. In the days of Shakespeare and the King James, there were 25,000. Uh-huh. Just in 1990, there were uh, 300,000 words. Wow. Because of the Internet and the mixing of the globe, um, the way the language is coming together, the way we communicate in so many different media, um, the language is changing a whole lot since uh, even the popular translations from 30 years ago were created. And another big change is in worship. With uh, 40% of congregations now have screens. Mm-hmm. And on those screens, they merge text and image. Yeah. And as you do that, it's, we compress our words, when mm. we, especially when we're um, using terms in negation like yeah. don't and shouldn't and yeah. you'll and those kinds of things. It's an oral thing. And another thing that's shifted in the language because of these changes is that it's much more emotional, evocative, and persuasive, uh, our language. It has to be to cut through all of the information flow. It's not as systematic and doctrinal and, and, you know, that that you got Mm -hmm. proposition a lot of the modern era. Yeah. So there's definitely the influences of postmodernism is calling for us to take another look at the language. And I can give some examples whenever you're ready. Well, yeah, I thought that was interesting, because I, when I was looking through the Bible, I, I, when I look at different translations, because I'm a Bible nerd, so I do this kind of stuff, right? Like, I know to, I, I look at certain passages to see what did the translators do with that passage, right? Mm-hmm. So one of the things I look at is I look at uh, Romans chapter 8. Right. I think that's such a troubling passage, the way it's been translated in some translations. And they make they make it inaccurate in my view. But anyway, I look at that one and I look at John 3.16 to see if they included the phrase, for God so loved the world that he gave his one only son, if they include that inside the quote from Jesus or as the editorial quote from the, from the John author. Um, so I look at those things. And when I looked at, at Romans chapter 8, that's when I, I hadn't read the press material yet to notice the... Uh, one way that we actually got to that is, you know, we put together 120 translators from 24 denominations. Yeah. But we also had 77 reading groups with paid field testers in 13 different denominations. And before the editors got their hands on uh, what the translators did, uh, we ran it through the reading groups. And each of those groups read the text out loud to each other and took very copious notes saying, uh, that's just awkward. I don't know what you, or I don't know what this refers to, or what is that pronoun? You know, Mm -hmm. who's that? And that kind of uh, testing, field testing, if you will, really helped uh, to get this into English that we actually speak. Uh, And there was an oral process there. Well, I think that's, I mean, I find it fascinating, actually. I I like Bibles and Bible translations just sort of on their their whole. But I find it fascinating that in 2007, you had sort of pitched this big idea. And now in September, on September 18th, 2011, I'm holding in my hand a copy of that of, of that Bible where you brought together hundreds of translators or more than a hundred translators mm-hmm. from varying uh, vantage points and different places in the world. Like this is one of the only translations I know of that gives equal weight of translation to people inside the North American context and outside the North American context. Like you brought all that stuff together and then did reading groups and managed to get the thing translated and printed and shipped you know, to my house by mm-hmm. September by September eighteenth, two thousand eleven. I mean, some people started college dictionary, which had a thousand authors from forty countries, and they wrote eight thousand four hundred articles. And we put it, <laughs> we, we managed that whole thing online. That's and, a big that's a big Excel spreadsheet right there. Yeah, there's a yeah. lot of databases, and <laughs> I knew if we could pull that off in four years, we could do this. So we, um, it there were about four hundred moving parts, and they were overlapping. And it was a matter of, you know, what used to take place is somebody would type a manuscript up or handwrite it. You know, the living Bible was handwritten. Yeah. And then somebody would type it in oh carbon paper, and they'd stick it in the mail. And two weeks later, somebody would say, yeah, I got that. And 
now it's about two to three seconds to get from point A to point B. Incredible. Well, that, that's Paul Franklin. He's going to hold on with us. We're talking about the Common English Bible, a new translation. You really ought to look at it. Uh, I, would, I would highly recommend it. We'll be back here with Paul and the Common English Bible on AM 950 and DougPadgerRadio.com. You're right about the stars. 